Michael is a leading specialist on Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan and their relations with the United States. He's the editor or co-editor of several books and has written extensively for international publications covering the U.S. policy in Afghanistan. He's the deputy director of the Asia program for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I spoke with Michael at our D.C. studio. Michael, it's great to talk to you about Afghanistan because I think it's just kind of fallen off the face of the earth, but the crisis there is still intense. It's still present. Uh, give us an idea of just how bad it is right now. I mean, it's hard to, uh, to put it into words. Um, I think from the time U.S. forces left Afghanistan and sanctions were imposed on the Taliban regime, um, you had this catastrophic humanitarian crisis that set in in a way that could only happen in a country that has for so long been almost totally dependent on international assistance and had already been experiencing economic problems. So, you know, I would argue that um, Afghanistan, uh, until the Ukraine crisis broke out, had by far the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. International sanctions against the Taliban first started in the 1990s, the first time it took power in Afghanistan. But many international aid groups and experts argue that sanctions actually harm the Afghan people. So give me a sense. I mean, you're talking about, uh, I mean, a lack of funding, but a lack of food. I mean, it just describe uh, what's everyday life like. Well, I mean, if it were, this is a country where there is essentially no cash to go around. And Afghanistan is not a country where credit cards are used wi uh, widely, to put it mildly. It's a very cash-dependent country, like most developing countries. And there's no cash to go around. There's no money coming into the country. Banks have limited money. Um, to the extent that banks are still operating and allowing people to withdraw money, there, there are limits being placed on how much money can be withdrawn. And as a result, people are literally starving. And so when you hear these, these dire warnings from the UN Food Program and others warning that you know, you're looking at 20, 25 million people in Afghanistan that are staring starvation uh, in the face. It's not an exaggeration. And a country of 40 million people, you're talking about well more than half the, the population uh, on the verge of, of famine and, and, and starvation. And when you t keep in mind that this is a country that was already dealing with um, an acute drought, one of the worst that it experienced in years, which had been putting added stress on agricultural production. So if you throw that in with this shock to the economy when you have no more money coming into the country because of sanctions, no more cash in the country, and the international community um, not willing to bring financial assistance into the country beyond humanitarian aid, really for political reasons, not wanting to put money in the Taliban's hands. I mean, this paints a picture of an incredibly desperate state of affairs um, for the Afghan people with no, with no clear end in sight. I mean, we hear so much about sanctions, but you always see the impact on, of sanctions, at least this is the way I perceive it, that what you just described, I'm, I'm a person who's just trying to eke out a life in Afghanistan, I'm punished. I don't necessarily think that the Taliban government is punished. Um, so talk to me about this because it seems like it's always the mechanism. Let's go with sanctions. And, and it plays well to a domestic audience, but, but what are the ramifications? I mean, if you look at all of the academic literature on sanctions policies over the years, look at all the cases when uh, sanctions have been imposed on a particular government, there are very few cases where there's indications that um, those sanctions do not hurt the common people and clear indications that they, well, they hurt the common people a lot more than they hurt the government that they're targeting. Now, this case in Afghanistan is a, is a bit unusual in the sense that the Taliban is not just any type of regime that's being sanctioned. I um, mean, the eyes of the U.S. and many countries in the West, you know, this is a regime that has close ties to Al Qaeda and that has some of the most retrogressive policies possible when it comes to the treatment of women, for example. So I think that, as you say, the domestic pressure, the domestic political pressures in Western capitals are such that it's just a, a political non-starter for a government to say, okay, we're going to overlook everything that the Taliban has done in the interest of getting as much money into the country as possible to bring more relief to the country. You could call that a heartless conclusion, but I think it's true, um, unfortunately. So the bottom line is indeed sanctions typically don't work. 
Is there a workaround? I mean, is there a way, is there a method to actually get the money to the people who need it with, uh, with I guess in a sense, that's, that's the conundrum, isn't it? They want to bypass the, the Taliban government, uh, not put money in their hands, not make it seem as though they're the ones that are improving someone's life. Uh, how do you get around that? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to distinguish between two types of assistance, humanitarian assistance and financial assistance. Humanitarian assistance is coming in with no conditions at all from the West. You know, we're talking about food shipments and you know, cash handouts <clears throat> that go directly to the people and they typically are distributed via the UN or other international aid agencies. There's no restrictions on that. But it's the aid that goes beyond humanitarian assistance. Broader development financial aid that typically would go to the government, would go to the state bank in Afghanistan and so on. That's where there's, there's been problems. And the good news is that there have been some workarounds that we've started to see. You know, the US government, for example, has announced new licenses that now make it possible for financial institutions, international financial institutions and banks to be able to bring money into Afghanistan, uh, deliver it to other private sector targets without having to worry about running afoul of sanctions. So you're starting to see a bit more flexibility uh, from the US government and other Western governments. I think there are also plans afoot to deliver assistance to certain um, aspects of the public sector in Afghanistan, like the health ministry, the education ministry, to ensure that, that the public school teachers can be paid and to make sure that, uh, uh, that doctors and nurses can be paid. So that's the start right there. As the US left Afghanistan in August of 2021, the Taliban vowed it would not cooperate with terrorist groups and that it would prevent the country from being a safe haven for terrorists. But the question remains, has the Taliban truly left behind its extremist ideology? What about uh, this kind of uh, belief system that was kind of percolating? Uh, this isn't your... Uh, you know, your uncle's Taliban or your grandfather's Taliban, the, the Taliban of 2000, these seem a lot more media savvy. They're speaking to the cameras. They're saying all the right things. I mean, what kind of Taliban are we looking at? I mean, it is a different Taliban um, in the sense that uh, they have realized that there are certain things that could be leveraged to their advantage, such as technology, social media, which of course didn't exist in the 1990s. Um, the art of public relations, which is something that the Taliban used to not care about at all, but they've un they now understand that um, by saying certain things and making certain token gestures, that could perhaps have an effect on certain audiences. But I think that what's really changed about the Taliban beyond all that is its desire for external legitimacy and recognition. When it was a pariah regime in the late 1990s when it was in control, it didn't really care what the world thought. It didn't really care about getting recognition from other governments. But that's what's changed now. It, it recognizes that there's benefits and advantages from that legitimacy and recognition, mainly because it, bring, it could potentially bring more financial assistance uh, into the group. But where the Taliban has not changed is on its ideology and its belief system. That has not changed at all. Um, it continues to be just as retrogressive uh, as it used to be. And I would argue that if the Taliban were actually to evolve its core ideologies, it would no longer be the Taliban uh, anymore. Now, there have been some, some internal ideological battles within the Taliban. You do have a younger generation of, um, of Taliban members who are a bit more moderate, uh, including some that had been based in, in, in Doha for some time, working in the political office. They were the ones that dealt with, with the world, with international diplomats. But the reality of the situation is that the hardliners, the hardest of the hard, the most hardline of the hardliners in the Taliban, they're the ones in full control. They occupy the top spots in government. They have all the power behind the scenes. Do they have a strategy for stability <clears throat> for the country? They don't really have a strategy at all, unfortunately. Um, and I think that for the Taliban, the hope is that someone will bail them out eventually, whether it's um, you know several of the neighboring countries, Pakistan, uh, China, some of the Central Asian states, they see some of these regional countries as more uh, receptive to provide more assistance uh, to the Taliban than so many countries in the West are. But at the end of the day, everyone wants to be cautious. I think everyone wants to, to take a wait and, and watch approach before agreeing to really engage in a big way with the Taliban. So no, I, I haven't seen any indication that the Taliban has any type of strategy 
for stabilization. Um, it doesn't seem to have a plan for the economic crisis. Terrorism is, of course, another major concern in Afghanistan because of Islamic State Khorasan. The Taliban has launched operations against Islamic State Khorasan, which is a rival of the Taliban's, but it's been very scorched earth in, in, in a tactical sense. And that risks alienating uh, a lot of people and producing more radicalizations. Um, so w- what I've seen with the Taliban is a lot of effort to appease the hardliners through hosting these huge military parades where they parade all these weapons that were seized from the, Af- from the previous Afghan government. I see these ceremonies to commemorate the families of Taliban suicide bombers. That's no strategy. That's basically just catering to the, uh, to the hardliners within the group. It doesn't do anything for the country. On August 26, 2021, in the final days of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, a suicide bomber carried out an attack at the international airport in Kabul, killing at least 170 Afghan civilians and 13 U.S. service members. The Islamic State Khorasan, also known as ISIS-K, claimed responsibility for the attack. Since the withdrawal of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, both Al-Qaeda and ISIS-K have grown in strength. A recent UN Security Council report stated, quote, terrorist groups enjoy greater freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. Take me forward uh, a year from now or five years from now, we have a conversation about Afghanistan. Uh, and we're still talking about Islamic State Khorasan, which you're one of the few people I ever hear even talking about it. Uh, best case scenario, worst case scenario. I mean, is it going to be something where we're going to be saying, geez, you know, I wish a year ago or five years ago we were focused on this or thinking about this. Nobody was really talking about it except for Michael Kugelman. I mean, is it going to be one of those kind of things? I mean, is that your fear? Yeah, I mean, I think as an analyst, one always has to assume the worst. And, and fear that you know things would get a lot worse before they get better. And if you look at the if, if you look at the signals over the last few months, right? What do you see with Islamic State Khorasan? You see a group that um, benefited from actions by the Taliban soon after it took over. It staged these jailbreaks that freed all these Islamic State Khorasan members from jail. So they've gotten major boost to their manpower. With the collapse of the Afghan military and the departure of U.S. forces, so many weapons lying around. The Taliban laid claim to most of them. Islamic State Khorasan was able to get many of them too. Another big thing that's benefited Islamic State Khorasan is that um, uh, you know there's no more airstrikes being used against uh, against the group. You know that's something that the NATO forces and the previous Afghan military had done. They've left. The Taliban does not know how to operate air power. Uh, The use of air power was a a really critical uh, tactic of counterterrorism. So now the, the Islamic State Khorasan is not getting that, which gives it space to grow out. So this all suggests to me that one year on, Islamic State Khorasan could be in a much stronger place than it is now. I don't know if it would have the capacity to carry out um, uh, attacks far beyond Afghanistan, but I think it will become more potent. What I would watch for, what I think we all have to watch for, is the issue of foreign fighters. Are we going to see militants coming into Afghanistan from Europe, from North Africa, from the U.S., from places far beyond Afghanistan to join forces with Islamic State Khorasan. It's going to be a stronger, more potent group, but not necessarily one that would be able to um, to, to pose a threat uh, to the West uh, and to the United States, uh, though, again, we can't afford to be complacent. How safe is the power for the country? I mean, for the, for the Taliban in terms of running the country. So for now, there's no viable opposition to the Taliban. There is a... Uh, an, anti, uh, an anti-Taliban resistance force, but it's largely based in Tajikistan. It's not able to do anything. ISK, Islamic State Khorasan, is the only opposition to the Taliban. It's obviously not viable because it's a terrorist group. So for now, the Taliban is secure. Um, it controls nearly 100% of the country. Back in the 1990s, it only controlled about 90% of the country. In the immediate term, its power is secure. Keep in mind, when the Taliban entered Kabul and and took over the country in August of last year, its main message was, we've brought peace, we've brought stability, work with us to rebuild the country. But if the Afghan people see that the terrorist attacks are continuing and that the uh, the economic crisis isn't going away, I think that could cause some major problems for the Taliban. Michael grew up in Europe and Asia. His interest in Afghanistan and the surrounding region started in graduate school. 
So I had a great experience in graduate school. Uh, my, my first semester of graduate school I took a great class on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. Had a great professor, and it was that class that made me realize, okay, this is a region that I want to study. So that's that's what goes to show that education matters. <laughs> but you would say, uh, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think you would say you're still a student. Absolutely. No, yeah. I think I think we all have to be humble, and I think that. It, even for those of us that have studied a particular region or a country for years, we need to always think of ourselves as students, not experts, because there's so much, there's always so much more to be learned. And especially Afghanistan, the broader region, so complex, so much to learn. And I think that um, we all have to be humble. Do you see any signs of progress right now or any hopeful signs emanating from Afghanistan? Yeah, right. I mean, in a, in a in a sea of bad news stories, you're always looking for an island of of some type of good news, right? Um, I mean, I think that there are some some indications that the humanitarian crisis is starting to ease just a bit, just because we've started to finally see a level of of support, of humanitarian support coming from uh, from countries to the point you don't have quite the level of provi privation that you had had several months ago. Um, I also think it is encouraging that at least for now. We have not seen as many attacks by Islamic State Khorasan. Does that mean that it's been weakened or that it's gone away? No, but you know we need to take these these small liberties where we can take them. And I think that at least for now, the Afghan people have been spared um, the 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 large scale terrorist attacks that they had been seeing in in in, in earlier months, and that's that's certainly a um, a good thing. But unfortunately, I, I just I, I look at the broader picture in Afghanistan. If the world restricts its response to addressing the humanitarian crisis by sending food aid and other immediate aid to Afghanistan without dealing with the broader contours of the economic crisis, such as a liquidity crisis, which means banks not having money. If the world continues to ignore that, that latter aspect of the economic crisis, you're just going to have cycles and cycles of humanitarian crises and nothing is really ever going to improve. The problem here is that to address that broader economic crisis beyond humanitarian assistance, that gets to the problem of engaging with the Taliban, right? This is where you have to talk about bringing more money into banks and to, and to government sectors, where there's a good chance that the Taliban will get its hands on that money, which many governments in the West don't want to see happen. So I do fear that there's no end in sight for the dire privations being experienced by, by the Afghan people. I so hope that I'm wrong, but um, I just really worry that this cycle of privation is just going to continue to play out for, for quite some time. That's terribly sad. Michael, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.